Good afternoon. When Facebook was getting started, desktop computers were the norm, and people largely used text to communicate. By putting cameras on phones, images are for emerging as a new form of language. We're using images to talk to each other, to tell what we're doing, and to share stories. My name is Mahalia Miller, and I'm the product lead on the Facebook AI's computer vision team. I'm here to share our session from visual recognition to visual reasoning. As Shrep mentioned in this morning's keynote, one of the, prob the hardest problems we face is how to deal effectively with problematic content. In this post, for example, you see a viral meme where they said that two UFOs landed on some fields in the Philippines. In fact, this was a promotional video for a conference, and this was the history local History Channel's logo on top of the fields, as one of our fact-checking partners realized. And so, in other words, there's a fundamental shift in what we're doing. What we would think of as a simple image classification, this is a field, is no longer sufficient. We must do more. Thus, the move is towards visual reasoning. Visual reasoning for Facebook problems means dealing effectively with the whole span from images, photos, to AR and VR in order to make a decision. If you remember one thing from this talk, remember this. We must deeply understand and reason about the images in order to protect the millions and billions of people who use our, problem, our products and meaningfully connect people and businesses. From the list of major AI advances this morning, these are those in the last five years of computer vision in the last five years at Facebook. In other words, we're not starting from square one. We have a really great start. So we see that some of these technologies are already having impact. For example, at last F8, we talked about weekly supervised learning that's already re reducing the prevalence of problematic content on our services. Before we continue, I'd like to make sure we're on the same page with regards to some terminology. I'm a new mother, so in order to illustrate this concept, let's think about how my baby learns. I'll go on a stroller walk with him, and I'll point every house, tree, car, etc., patiently labeling each and every one. That's, a, in other words, fully supervised learning. But sometimes I'll make mistakes. I'll forget the name of a certain tree. Not quite right, but most of the time I get it right. That's another way of saying weekly supervised learning, this learning from noisy labels. But there's more than I can possibly label. So he'll learn from some of the things I learned as he sees brand new things. And that's another way of saying semi-supervised learning. But more and more, he's just observing what's around him, learning through curiosity, play, and observation. This making sense of relationships and understanding and learning for the sake of learning itself is what we call self-supervised learning. At Facebook, we're investing in the full scale from fully supervised to self-supervised learning. So now that we're clear on some of the terminology and we've talked through how this is really critical to deal with a lot of the problematic content that's all over our platform, why else are we excited? Why am I excited? Well, I like looking for good deals. So sometimes I'm just looking on Marketplace, trying to curate pieces for my home. And for example, imagine that I find this killer deal on a Herman Miller Eaton's chair. Now, the computer vision system could understand, could isolate, hey, that's a chair. It could understand the content. This is a mid-century modern style. It could understand through co-occurrences of the product what other things I might like, what sort of price point I might care, uh, care about. And so then it would be no-brainer for, for the AI system to say, hey, let me connect you with Ava from San Francisco, because her table, this Noguchi coffee table, would be a perfect fit. It's the same style, similar price point, it would be a great fit for me, and it would make that connection. And so, in summary, whether it's to effectively deal with problematic content, such as the misinformation, or it's to open up new experiences for how we can meaningfully connect people and businesses, we're seeing that it's critical to go from visual recognition to make steps and progress towards visual reasoning. In the rest of this talk, my colleagues are gonna share some of the gaps and what steps we're taking and in innovating to work towards our goal. 
You'll hear from Deepti, talking about video understanding at scale. From Zeki, about learning from unlabeled data sets. From Cernam, how we must deal with the adversarial cases in tandem. And finally, to my colleague Roshan, for scaling visual reasoning. And now, to my colleague Deepti. Thanks, Mahalia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to F8. I'm really excited to be here and to give you a sneak peek of some of our video understanding efforts. People come to Facebook family of apps every day to share their stories and to connect with like-minded people, communities, and causes. This one important aspect of Facebook's mission is to enrich our users' experience. For example, I absolutely love coffee and enjoy searching and browsing video tutorials on different coffee brewing techniques. An ideal experience for me is when I can easily search and retrieve videos that I like, get recommendations on more videos that I may enjoy, and perhaps go one step further and get help in shopping for some of these brewing devices. A second equally crucial aspect of Facebook's mission is to keep our users safe in real time. This means proactively identifying and taking down videos containing harmful content, such as hate speech or pornography or self-harm. We deeply care about these problems at Facebook and have been very actively working towards tackling them. Every day, Facebook family of apps ingests tens and thousands of hours of videos, and nearly hundreds of millions of hours of videos are watched per day. Constructing a fully supervised video dataset to cater to this humongous scale is impractical. Unlike images, information in a video arrives incrementally and sequentially. Video is often associated with audio, which also arrives sequentially. In an entire given video sequence, the action of interest to me occurs for a brief period of time, and the rest is noise. Videos thus suffer from information redundancy between edges and frames, and temporal noise before and after the action of interest. These two issues further complicate video modeling. To summarize, there, there are two key aspects that make video understanding very, very challenging. One is the sheer volume of videos at Facebook, and second is to effectively tackle the spatial and temporal modeling of videos. Now, in the remaining portion of this, uh, of this talk, I'll present how we at Facebook AI have been tackling these issues for the task of video action recognition. To tackle the issue of extreme scale, we made a fundamental shift towards weak supervision. I'm so proud of our team to have trained a strong action recognition model on several millions of publicly shared Instagram videos and hashtags. Now, if you look at your Instagram feed, videos are often tagged with hashtags. These hashtags often describe the objects and events occurring in these videos, essentially giving a textual description of the visual content in them. This rich metadata is available in great abundance and can potentially provide a good supervisory signal to understand videos. Hashtags, however, have a lot of noise. Some of the most popular hashtags on Instagram are non-visual concepts such as Throwback Thursday or Insta Daily. We often tag our videos with several incorrect hashtags. Now, one issue that is specific to the task of action recognition is that hashtags are not action-oriented. That is, hashtags are not uh, followed using a subject, verb, object, phrase structure, such as pouring hot water from a kettle, but instead are given in a very free-form language, such as hashtag hot water, hashtag kettle. This label noise poses a significant challenge while training our video models. Real-world data is often heavily skewed and long-tailed. Some of the most popular actions, such as yoga or playing guitar, have millions of videos associated with them, while a number of different actions only have a handful. One such action is sign language interpretation. We deeply care about such concepts as we continue building AI tools that benefit everyone. We currently lack sufficient videos for several such important concepts. How do we train a classifier that understands all of these concepts, but from only two or three example videos? We overcame all of these technical challenges and trained our video models at an unprecedented scale of using over 65 million publicly shared Instagram videos. 
We used only the hashtags as is as our labels, thereby reducing the amount of supervision needed. Since we trained our models on noisy hashtags, we call this weak supervision. The largest known widely used benchmark video data set has only six million videos. Thus, our models are trained at an order of magnitude more videos than the industry standard. We trained our models on over 200 GPUs. For the sake of comparison, if we had trained the same model on one GPU, it would have taken us 15 years to complete training. But thanks to Facebook's fantastic distributed training infrastructure, we were able to train the same model in 27 days. Our largest model, R2 plus 1D152, has over 118 million parameters. The R2 plus 1D architecture was open sourced in last F8. We then take this pre-trained model and fine tune it on the target task of action recognition. Now, Kinetics is a very popular benchmark dataset. It has about 300,000 videos and 400 actions. The current best published method achieves a top one accuracy of 77.7%. Our 65 million pre-training model, followed by a fr smart frame selection strategy, achieves a whopping accuracy of 82.8%. This is a significant boost of 5.1%, making this the best action recognition system in the world. While the previous method uses a combination of audio, visual, and motion signals, our 65 million pre-training model uses only the visual signal as input. Now, Epic Kitchens is another very popular uh, benchmark data set. It's, it's challenging because it consists of first-person videos. The current best published method achieves a top one accuracy of 21%. Our 65 million pre-training method achieves an accuracy of 25.6%, again, a significant boost of 4.6%. While the previous method is an ensemble model, we achieve our gains from a single model using only visual signals as input. Note that even our best method has an error rate of 74%. This not only highlights the difficulty of this data set, but also highlights that the progress in video understanding is just getting started. This work has been accepted in this year's CVPR, and we just released a blog post on ai.facebook.com with more technical details and a link to our paper, so definitely check it out. Let's switch gears a bit. In addition to effectively tackling extreme scale, it is equally important to model the videos effectively. We've made great progress along these axes, and only in the past one year have published an array of novel video architectures. One such model is slow fast networks. It's based on the fundamentals of our human visual system. Human brain perceives the spatial and temporal semantics in a video very differently. Thus, the network is, uh, is factorized to treat the spatial and temporal information separately. The video is modeled, at, uh, is sampled at different temporal resolutions, and the slow pathway handles the spatial semantics of the video, while the fast pathway handles the motion and temporal semantics of the video. Both pathways are connected via lateral connections. This mo model exhibits very strong performance across all baselines. Another model called channel separable networks is based on the observation that the channel interactions in a 3D convolutions are very sparse. Thus, some of these interactions can be intelligently skipped with minimal or no losses in accuracies. More importantly, channel factorization brought down the compute time by a factor of three, which is very, very significant. In practice, interestingly, we achieved gains in accuracies, and this is because channel factorization is helping the model regularize better. So far, I've presented our successes where we've effectively used visual signal from a video. But is visual signal alone enough? Imagine the possibility where there is a coffee brewing tutorial that was made in Costa Rica, but is automatically summarized in English with the power of AI. Video is often associated with audio, speech, and text. How do we effectively leverage this information from multiple modalities to further improve content understanding? We've approached this problem from multiple directions simultaneously. We've, we now have trained multi-model architectures that model the video and the text from the speech transcripts and video and the associated audio signals. Our joint uh, audio uh, video model achieves a further improvement of 20% on identifying some 
important concepts such as profanity and adult content when compared to a visual model alone. These promising results make us very excited about our future steps. Now, I'm sure you've heard this many times over the past two days at F8 that at Facebook, we say that our journey is only 1% finished. And this is very true with video content understanding. We've made great progress, but we have a number of interesting and exciting directions yet to explore. One such direction we are currently working on is semi-supervision. And to talk more about it, please welcome Zeki on stage next. Thank you. Thank you, Dipti. This is me. Eight years old, Zeki, uh, with spoon ears and a big smile. Uh, I remember myself collecting seeds and leaves from plants and categorizing them. Uh, it was my hobby to discover what makes each plant unique and special. Can you imagine there are more than 300,000 plant species known to science, and uh, most of them are pretty uncommon? Probably an average person witnesses less than 1% of all life forms during their lifetime. Isn't it sad? Facebook and Instagram have the most diverse user base from all seven continents. People witness, discover, and share all the treasures of nature and human culture in all forms. It has been a fascinating experience for me to work at Facebook, building machine learning models to unearth all the diversity and colors of life. At the beginning of this session, Mahalia talked about different levels of supervision for training machine learning models. Clearly, we cannot enumerate all possible visual concepts. We cannot collect enough number of training samples for each of them. In the previous talk, Deepti has demonstrated that we can use rich hashtag Facebook data for training better and better models. However, most of the visual content still, it does, they don't have enough, uh, any, tech, uh, inf any labels. And uh, Weak supervision cannot make use of uh, unlabeled, untagged visual content. State-of-the-art models are also often computationally very expensive and uh, not preferred for production use cases. Now we are going one step further and introducing a semi-supervised learning framework. We show that we can learn directly from unlabeled data sets and we can make lightweight production scale models much more accurate. In machine learning, if we get to train a target model with all the available supervision, this is called fully supervised learning. And the accuracy of the target model is determined by the scale and the quality of the labeled data set we have. At Facebook, we investigated the best practices for learning from unlabeled data sets. We came up with the following semi-supervised training framework. First, we train a large capacity the best accurate model we can train with all the available labeled data set we have. We use this highly accurate teacher model to predict labels for the unlabeled data set. We rank all the unlabeled examples against each class and pick the top scoring ones. We use those ones to pre-train the target student model with, uh, with those examples. Finally, we fine tune the student model with all the available label tests that we initially had and trained the teacher model with. The resulting target model is expected to learn both from its teacher and also the unlabeled data set to produce higher accuracy with respect to the fully supervised baseline. We evaluated our approach for training a widely used ResNet 50 production scale model on ImageNet 1K image classification benchmark. First, we train a 33 times higher capacity ResNext teacher model with all the available supervision. The teacher model achieves 79.6% top one accuracy on the validation set. Our baseline is the fully supervised ResNet 50 model. It provides 76.4% top one accuracy. If we use the teacher model to select pre-training examples from a publicly available 100 million unlabeled web image data set, and we use those pre-selected samples for training the student model, we achieve 79.1% uh, accuracy. This is 2.7% top one accuracy improvement with respect to the fully supervised baseline. And notice that the accuracy gap between the teacher and the student model has been reduced to only half, half a percent. Next, we investigated the importance of the teacher model accuracy for training the student model. 
On the leftmost, we see that small capacity ResNet 18 feature model doesn't help provide any accuracy gain with respect to the fully supervised ResNet 50 model baseline. However, if we use the same architecture for both the teacher model, we get 1% accuracy gain. This is also referred to as self-training in the machine learning literature. As the teacher capacity model, uh, the, as, as the capacity of the teacher model increases, the accuracy of the student model also greatly improves. Higher capacity teacher models helps us build better models, better student models. So in order to get the state of the art results, we replace the teacher model with the state of the art ImageNet model ever trained. This is the model we introduced last year here at F8. The teacher model is weakly supervised on 3.5 billion hashtag images, and it provides 85.4% tough one accuracy. The weak to supervised ResNet 50 model, pre-trained exactly on the same data set with the same parameters provides 78.2%. If we use this weakly supervised state-of-the-art model to select pre-training samples from the uh, 3.5 billion hashtag image data set, and we use these examples for pre-training the student model, we get 81.2% top one accuracy. This is 3% absolute accuracy gain with respect to the weakly supervised baseline. And if we compare it to the fully supervised case, the accuracy gain is 4.8%. Now, the difference between the state-of-the-art best-performing ImageNet model and the production-scale ResNet 50 model has been greatly reduced from 9% to only 4.2%. Now, we investigate the representation power of our ImageNet models for transfer learning tasks. First, we fine-tune the last layer of the fully supervised ResNet 50 model for the CAP 2011 bird image classification task. This is our first baseline, and we get 73.3% top one accuracy on bird recognition data set. If we use the weakly supervised ResNet 50 model, we were to get 74% top one accuracy. And our best performing ImageNet model, semi weakly supervised ImageNet model, provides the best numbers for this transfer learning task, which is 80.7. The accuracy gain is 6.7% with respect to the weakly supervised baseline. This is significant. Our teacher-student-based semi-supervised learning framework also generalizes well for video classification tasks. We have chosen Kinetics 400 video action classification benchmark for our evaluations. We use the state-of-the-art weakly supervised R2 plus 1D video classification model as our teacher. This is the same model deeply introduced in her talk. We use this teacher model to predict labels from the same weekly supervised Instagram 65 million video data set it is pre-trained with. We rank all the videos against each action class and pick the top scoring examples for pre-training the lower capacity R2 plus 1D student model. Finally, we fine tune the student model with all the available labeled videos. 24 times more expensive state-of-the-art teacher model provides 82.8% top one accuracy on the validation set. Training the student model with weak supervision, exactly with the same data and in the same way, provides 71.5% top one accuracy. Pre-training the student model with the example sampled from the weakly supervised data set, sampled by the state-of-the-art teacher model gives us 74.2% top one accuracy. This is 2.7% absolute accuracy gain with respect to the weakly supervised student model. And with respect to the fully supervised case, the accuracy gains are much bigger, 9.4%. I'm happy to announce that we are going to publish all our findings as an archive paper today. So why all of this matters to us? So our teacher-student-based semi-supervised training approach helps improve the accuracy of lightweight production scale models by a large margin. More accurate lightweight classification models deployed in production helps us understand visual content much better. So we use this information to improve user experience. Most importantly, accurate models help detect more bad content and keep Facebook safe. Our next speaker, Senam, will talk about this topic specifically.
Thank you, Zaki. Hello, everybody. Today, I'm here to tell you how Facebook use our world-class AI technologies to protect the integrity of our platform. And more importantly, to protect the integrity of the content, including images and videos that our users are seeing on our platform. Now, before I begin, I want to be clear. Facebook AI is producing world-class technologies, but AI is far from perfect yet. So our goal is not to fully automate the process. Rather, our goal is to assist human reviewers to get to the objectionable content as quickly and as effectively as possible. So today, I'm going to touch on two topics. The first topic I'm going to talk about is how do we take Facebook AI technologies, repurpose it quickly, and then turn around and protect the integrity of the content that users are, taking, uh, are looking at. The second topic I'm going to talk about is how do we make our model robust? This is very important. Some of these models are used to filter out objectionable content, such as porn and violence. And so it's, we need to make them as robust as possible and train them at scale. So how do we leverage Facebook world-class AI technology? One of the phenomenon that we have been observing is this. A lot of the images and videos that come into Facebook has actually been tampered with and manipulated. So you see in this uh, slide, in this image, a clown has been what we call spliced into the image. And we want to detect these images. So how do we do this? One of the better known technology that came out of Facebook AI is what we call Detectron. Detectron is an award-winning technology. Its Mars RCNN won the Mar Prize Award at ICCV 2017, and its RetinaNet won the Best Student Paper Award at the same conference. Detectron is originally used to detect object classes, such as person, cars, animals, and so on and so forth. So how do we use this technology to detect manipulated images? We take a look at what we call the Region Proposal Network as part of Detectron, or in short, what we call RPN. RPN was used to detect object classes, as I mentioned, but we repurpose it to detect whether it's manipulated or unmanipulated. And the result is pretty impressive. As you can see here, we were able to detect the clown you saw in the image earlier. And even in the middle image, we were even able to detect text that has been spliced in the, into the image. And on the right, you see that we are, we are able to detect a shark that has been spliced into the ocean water. Now, detecting manipulations in images and videos is one thing. But what we really want to do is able to detect misinformation and fake news. And that's what we did. We took the RPN signal and we used it to detect misinformation and fake news. And the blue line shows the performance. But we asked a question, how can we enhance the performance by adding what we call engagement signals to our RPN signals. And this include impression, user comments, user reports, and virality. And by adding these engagement signals together with the RPN signals, this is what we get. Pretty, pretty impressive uh, boost in performance. What is more important here and not actually shown in this slide is this. We actually took out the RPN signal from an engagement signal, and it actually performed worse in terms of detecting misinformation and fake news. We have seen deploy this model to detect integrity issues in data associated with elections. And now I'm going to talk about a second form of image manipulation known as adversarial perturbations. So in recent years, researchers have shown that by adding a small amount of noise, imperceptible, it actually could fool the model 
reducing its accuracy sometimes by more than 50%. So here in this slide, you see on the left, there's a clean image of a goose. And on the right, it's the same image, but it has adversarial perturbation added to it. Perceptually, you don't see much difference, right? However, if you take a look at the feature map created by our deep models, the one on the right is much noisier. And this is responsible for reducing the accuracy of our model by sometimes more than 50%, as I mentioned. So how do we deal with this? Another one of the award-winning technology that came out of Facebook AI is demonstrated in this slide. So on the left, again, you see images that has adversarial perturbation added to it. In the middle, again, is the very noisy uh, feature map as a result of the adversarial perturbations. But on the right, our solution here introduced this denoising block into the model architecture and successfully clean up the feature map significantly. So you're gonna ask, so what does that do for us? Quantitatively, it's pretty impressive. Under white box attack, where we assume that the attackers know the architecture of our model, our solution improved the accuracy by three to four percent. Under black box attack, where we assume that the attackers does not know the architecture of our model, our solution improved accuracy by six to seven percent. What is even more impressive is on the right. Researcher in this area knows that most, if not all, adversarial defense approach actually degrade the performance of the model itself. But this solution not only did not do that, but actually sometimes improve accuracy of the model. Now I'm gonna take a look at a second solution to deal with adversarial perturbations. Imagine this, if we have 50 billion public clean image, what can we do with it? I'm glad you asked. We built this manifold of 50 billion images, and we know it's clean, right? So any incoming image, we compare it with this manifold. And if it's off the manifold, we'll flag it to the human reviewer. Makes a lot of sense. But what is more important here is this. It's not feasible to compare an image with each of the 50 billion images. You'll never finish. So here, again, we utilize Facebook AI world-class technology in fast image indexing and was able to do this operation extremely fast. So far, I have talked about how we leverage Facebook AI technologies, repurpose it, and use it to detect bad content, manipulated content. Now I'm gonna switch gear a little bit and talk about how we make our model robust. Now as mentioned earlier, this is very important because some of these models are used to filter out objectionable content such as porn and violence, and so it is very important to make them as robust as possible. I'm gonna show you an example in this slide. In this image, there is a picture of two train. And if we overlay patterns on it like this, as you see here, we still want our model to be robust enough to detect that there are two trains in the image. And what's more important is that we want to train this model to be robust at scale. So I'm gonna introduce a self-supervised training methods. This is what we call a GAN model. Imagine this, we have an input image and we randomly overlay random patterns on this image. Now, at this point, note this, there is no human annotation needed because when we overlay this pattern, it's done randomly and fully automatically. And then we take this image, we pass it through the model, which we call a generator and we want the generator to recover the original unmodified image. And we train it this way, self-supervised. And then during test time after training, we take that model and any image that has any random pattern overlay on it, we'll pass it through our model to recover the original image. 
Now, what's very important here is this. If the image is clean, there's no pattern on it, it does not degrade the performance. This approach came in handy when we start seeing porn images with patterns overlay on it, trying to bypass our filter. And we use our model and recover the original untempered image and it was able to restore the performance of our filter effectively, as you can see in this slide. I'm gonna give you a second example of how we make our model robust. We have also observed this. A lot of, well not a lot, some of the images, face images that came into Facebook are not real. They are fake. So let me tell you what that means. Here on the left is a real face image of my teammate, Ashish. And on the right is a real face image of another of my teammate, Alex. We have developed technology to be able to combine their appearance and expressions, obviously producing a much better looking person, but <laughs> what is most important here is this. We are able to do this at scale. And by doing this at scale, we could train a classifier to differentiate between real and thick face images very effectively. I'm gonna end with two key takeaways. Number one, Facebook AI is producing world-class technologies. But let's be real, let's face it. AI is not perfect yet, we know that. So our goal, and I'm gonna reiterate, is we want to assist human reviewers to get to the bad content as effectively as possible. The second key takeaway is this, Facebook is serious about investing in AI and using our investment here to protect what our users are seeing on our, uh, on our platform. And with that, I'm gonna pass off to Roshan, who is gonna to talk to you about how we train model at scale. Thank you. Thanks, Sanam. My name is Roshan, and I lead a few teams that focus on scaling vision platforms. And one of the main questions we ask ourselves every day is how can we decrease the time from research to production? How can we make it easy for a new innovation in, say, modeling to go from a research paper to something that's deployed at scale? And more importantly, how can we provide this to our product teams so as to enable them to build richer new product experiences? That's gonna be the focus of my talk. And let me motivate this with two fairly recent use cases. Last year at F8, we spoke about ResNex 3D, our new video understanding model. We use this as our backbone network to train a classifier for finding policy violating videos. This went all the way from a research paper to something that was running at scale in a matter of two months. And best of all, this runs on every video that gets uploaded onto our platform, which can account for billions of videos on a daily basis. Another example from the Instagram land is the ability for us to provide automatic alternative text for images. Think of these as one-line sentences that describe what's happening in an image, and it's super useful for the 200 million visually impaired people around the world that leverage screen readers. This, through, this too went through all the phases of deployment, all the way from data annotation to training to de deployment in a matter of three months. And it also runs at an unprecedented scale of billions of images daily within a few seconds of the image being uploaded onto the platform. You may start seeing a theme here. And the theme is, for us to truly decrease that time from research to production, the one key thing that we need to keep thinking about is scale. And this bottleneck of scale is not just in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of tools and processes along the way. So let's try to understand what would a vision researcher go through in order to deploy such a, a model to production. They would generally start off by generating training data, and even though we're trying to reduce the amount of supervision required, there's still some amount of human annotation. Once they have the data ready, the next step would be to train their neural networks, ideally in a distributed setting, and then to finally take this network and deploy it in a service where it's run on every image and video as it gets uploaded. Let's try to break each and every one of them down with scale in mind, starting with gathering training data. Remember, once a researcher has sourced data from a bunch of places, they work with a community of labelers by providing them clear instructions on how to annotate their data sets. 
These instructions are generally in the form of a user interface that has been created by the researcher and is used by the community of labelers to annotate their data, with the final output being stored in some sort of a privacy-compliant label data store. Now, there are two sticking points about this setup. Number one is researchers generally very quickly prototype these user interfaces with minimal amount of fidelity. And the second thing we started noticing was as more and more researchers came on board with more models and tasks, we started seeing a massive proliferation of these user interfaces. And what that meant for our community of labelers was that onboarding became extremely slow and there was no best practices shared across these user interfaces. So this prompted us to step back and build Halo. Halo stands for Human AI Loop. Think of it as a plug and play platform that allows us to easily create new annotation UIs with minimal amount of coding. Halo leverages React components. So for example, if you're training a detector to find dog faces, you would use a React component for bounding boxes, and that would work across images as well as videos. Having one platform generate all these annotation UIs is also useful from a dissemination of best practices perspective, all the way from having standardized UI templates to having downstream analytics. Halo has gone multimodal thanks to the increasing set of React components we have in our library, supporting use cases all the way from image classification to even 3D masking. Halo at this, at this stage is extremely self-serve and has become an integral part of our developer experience, allowing us to scale to multiple orders of more labelers, use cases, as well as media. Okay, zooming back out. Once data is ready, the next hurdle is training. And remember, given the size of our data sets, most researchers opt, out for, opt in for a multiple GPU environment. What we've done here is build scalable abstractions that allow the researcher to focus on writing their distributed training jobs without having to worry about the underlying infrastructure issues. This has been an absolute game changer in terms of productivity for our researchers, allowing easy creation of both data parallel as well as model parallel modes of job training. Moving along, once we have the, the model ready, the next step is to think about inference and to run this on, on a service that runs on every image and video. Let's start by understanding what would be the key requirements of such a service. A service, this service would need to elastically scale up and down based on seasonality. This is critical as there are certain events in the year where a lot more media is uploaded onto our platform, say New Year's. Second, the service needs to support diverse set of models all the way from different architectures to different storage options. And this is important because we don't want to create a new service every time a new architecture comes outside. Finally, the service needs the ability to run arbitrary graphs of operations, where these operators could be pre-processing steps, like you cropping an image or decoding a video, but also allow you to combine the output of multiple models together. So with these three tenants in mind, we built Cortex. Cortex is our internal service for scalable inference of vision models. Here's what the architecture of Cortex looks like at a very high level. Every Cortex node listens to a stream of videos and images as they get uploaded onto our platform. The node then runs this programmatically created set of operators. And then finally, the output of this graph is either stored in some sort of a standardized storage system or is passed down to another service for downstream analysis. The beauty of this architecture is that the Cortex node is extremely stateless, allowing us to scale up and scale down as needed. Cortex like Halo has become an integral part of our experience and has seen massive adoption internally. To the extent that over the last two years, we've had a 3.5x increase in our inference capacity. Now you could argue at our scale, 3.5x could easily have become 7x or 10x. So it's important for us to be thinking about efficiency along the way. We have a number of efficiency initiatives all the way from quantization to network pruning. But I wanted to focus on one fairly recent development that required us to go back to thinking about the fundamental building block of a neural network, which is the convolution. And it started with a very simple insight. We know that different information is conveyed at different spatial frequencies in an image. So for example, if I were to take this image and I were to decompose it into two frequency bands that are one octave apart, you would notice that the higher frequency encodes finer details like edges, while lower frequency encodes smoother information. Another insight is the, the lower frequency band has a lot of spatial redundancy baked in thanks to the smoothness. Extrapolating from this insight, we thought, what if we could change the feature map, which is the intermediate representation of an image in a neural network, and also factorized it into two tensors that are one octave apart, thereby creating this multi-frequency feature representation. 
And then you are leveraging the second insight that there's a lot of spatial redundancy in the lower frequency domain. What if we reduce the spatial resolution of that tensor, thereby saving a lot of space? And then we could create a new convolution that directly operates on these two tensors instead of the original feature map representation. We call this convolution the octave convolution. The beauty of this convolution is that it is a drop-in replacement to the standard convolution, requiring absolutely no change in your overall architecture. And given that we've decreased that spatial resolution, we are way more memory uh, efficient. And that can translate up to 40% drop in terms of your compute and up to 50% drop in terms of your latency. These type of fundamental investments in research for efficiency are critical for us to keep scaling our infrastructure, especially as more and more complicated architectures uh, come on board. So in summary, we presented the workflow of a vision researcher and highlighted how scale can act as a bottleneck at each stage. We then showed how investment in scalable annotation platforms, scalable abstractions over GPUs, as well as a scalable inference service can act as important building blocks that'll, that'll eventually help us alleviate that bottleneck and more importantly, help us achieve our North Star, which is to keep further decreasing the time from research to production. Okay, stepping back we're still very far away from true visual reasoning. Machines have gotten really, really good at semantic recognition, thanks to the large volumes of label data that we've thrown at it, and in some cases, they've even uh, beaten human performance. We believe that investment in reducing supervision, making our models robust, and thinking of scale at each and every stage are gonna be the key ingredients that allow us to leap from a visual recognition system to a visual reasoning system. And that, in turn, will help us fight misinformation uh, more effectively and meaningfully connect people and businesses. So with that, I thank you for coming for this talk, and I hope you learned something new.